Welcome back to our lecture series, Math 1210, Calculus 1 for students at Southern Utah University. As usual, I am your professor today, Dr. Andrew Misseldine. Uh, this lecture is actually kind of an interesting lecture because it's not just the 47th lecture for uh, calculus 1. This also will serve as the first lecture for Calculus 2, Math 1220, for students at Southern Utah University. Uh, this is a little bit of the overlap here because the Fundamental Theorem of Calculus Part 2, or in Calculus 2, we'll just call this the Fundamental Theorem of Calculus, uh, serves as really like the bread and butter for a lot of the type of calculations we're going to be doing in the future. Uh, calculations of definite integrals is something we do all the time in Calculus 2. It's an important principle for Calculus 1, but it's worth reviewing as we go into Calculus 2. So this lecture is going to serve uh, both purposes in that regard. Uh, let me slide up the slides a little bit. Let's talk about the Fundamental Theorem Calculus Part 2. We've seen the first part of the Fundamental Theorem Calculus uh, which determines that derivatives and integrals are actually inverse operations. Uh, the second part shows us how to use antiderivatives to compute uh, definite integrals. So the Fundamental Theorem Calculus Part 2 says this specifically. If f is a continuous function, uh, continuity is necessary uh, for a couple reasons. We'll see a reason why later on, but in particular the, the Fundamental Theorem Calculus Part 1 uses uh, continuity here and the part two is going to follow very quickly from part one so if f is continuous on a domain a to b then the definite integral that is the integral from a to b of f of x dx can be cute it can be computed as capital f of x uh which you see this vertical line here a b there uh that's just gonna be shorthand for this right here capital f of x uh you're going to take f of b minus f of a so again, kind of pointing out here that this vertical line notation you see is just going to be shorthand for plug in the numbers A and B and subtract them. Uh, where this capital F of X is an antiderivative of little f. That is capital F prime equals little f prime. So what the fundamental theorem calculus tells us right here is that if we want to compute a definite integral, what we can do is we can find any antiderivative, any antiderivative here, and with any antiderivative, we can we can evaluate at the endpoints of the interval a and b and take the difference. And this will help us in terms of our calculation of the uh, the definite integral. And so I want to talk about the proof of this statement a little bit. And so the exact proof you can see to the left side of the screen, I'm going to kind of summarize it for us here. Uh, you're welcome to read through this, or you can also download the script of this lecture, which is uh, you can find in the comments uh, below. And so let's take some area function g of x equals the integral from a to x of f of t dt. These type of integral functions were the main focus of the Fundamental Theorem Calculus Part 1, and so that's what we're going to use right here. We see that if we take the derivative of g, this will just equal little f of x. Um, that follows by ftc1. And so what this tells us is that uh, this function g of x, this is an antiderivative of the function f. It's an antiderivative, and it's not, I mean, because there's not one unique antiderivative. We've seen that plus C before. This constant A kind of keeps track of, uh, if we had different A's, we would get different antiderivatives. So we just have an antiderivative right here. And so we know that all antiderivatives only differ by a constant, right? So if you have two antiderivatives, you know, capital F and capital G are something like that, or in this case, lowercase g, is our antiderivative. It's an antiderivative. Uh, antiderivatives only differ by a constant. So capital F of X will equal little g of X plus a constant. Uh, th that's how they, that's, that they're only going to differ by that constant right here. And so we know, uh, we know that any antiderivative of little f will look like this. It'll look like this g of X plus a constant. Uh, and that's not going to make any big difference in terms of the calculation of the plus constant right here. And we'll, we'll talk about that in just a second. So using the continuity right here, using the continuity of these antiderivatives, we're also going to get that f of a is going to equal g of a, whoops, g of a plus a constant. And we can do this for b as well. 
so we can evaluate the function at these locations and get these things right here. All right, so I want you to look at this calculation right here, and we're going to focus over here because this one uh, explains it well enough. Um, if you take the difference, f of b minus f of a, well, by the identities we identified over here, f of b is the same thing as g of b plus c, and f of a is just the same thing as g of a plus c. And so when you take the difference of these things, notice that you're gonna get a plus C and a minus C. Those are gonna cancel out giving us this statement right here. This is why it doesn't matter which antiderivative you get here. Um, when it comes to the fundamental theorem of calculus, you can use any antiderivative because the plus C would cancel out. That doesn't mean we should never ever consider the plus C. If we're talking about a, a, an indefinite integral, the general antiderivative family, you do need that plus C. But for definite integrals, any antiderivative works here and you could use assume C is zero in such a situation. Uh, the other, and so then if you look at the definition of G, right? G of X, remember, is this function uh, that we saw earlier. It's the function where you take the integral from A to X of F of T dt, right? And so we're gonna plug in for this X, the value A and B, uh, which you see here and here. Now, if you evaluate an integral from a to a, it doesn't matter what the function is, that thing's going to equal zero, right? So essentially, it just is gone. And so you're left with the original expression f of b minus f of a is equal to the integral from a to b of f of t dt. And so typically, we're going to work this way. We start with the integral. If we can compute an antiderivative, we can evaluate the limits of the integral at the antiderivative and taking their difference will give us, uh, that'll give us the definite integral to give us the area under the curve. And so there's two important takeaways I want you to get from this fundamental theorem calculus with its proof. Um, the first is I've already mentioned is that, um, well, well, maybe I haven't mentioned this, but, but let me say some more about this. Well, I mean, we know we, we, we talked about this. And we'll, we, we'll say it again here is that with the fundamental theorem, you can use any, any antiderivative you want of little f, it doesn't matter which one you use. And so suppose that you have an antiderivative of f, like we saw a moment ago, when you take this f of x plus c, the plus c's are gonna cancel out. And so you just end up with f of b minus f of a. The plus c you are allowed to ignore when it comes to definite integrals. So with definite integrals, uh, you don't need c. No plus C is necessary. But for indefinite integrals, for these indefinite integrals, let me emphasize, you must have the plus C. Because the indefinite integral, this is looking, this is the general antiderivative of the function. And so you'll often look at this as the integral of f of x dx, you'll notice that the numbers here are missing. You don't see any there whatsoever. The definite integral, on the other hand, you will see the bounds, the integral from a to b of f of x dx. It's important to, that these things are related, as the fundamental theorem tells us, but they're not exactly the same thing. For example, the definite integral is going to give us a number because we're looking for the area under a curve. Um, the indefinite integral, on the other hand, gives us a family a family of functions, and those functions are going to be the antiderivatives of little f. And that's why the plus c is necessary, because without the plus c, you're not getting the general family. So that's one remark I want to mention. A second remark uh, to mention here is that the fundamental theorem of calculus does not give us the definition of the integral. Um, the, the definite integral, like we said, is the area under the curve. It's a number. It's a limit of a Riemann sum. That's the definition that, that limit of Riemann sums. The fundamental theorem of calculus just gives us a tool to calculate the area under the curve using antiderivatives. It doesn't say that definite integrals are equal. It doesn't say that they are antiderivatives. Definite integrals are is limits of Riemann sums. And that distinction will be very helpful as we work with uh, definite integrals and indefinite integrals in the future.